Welcome back to part two of the religion of broken telephone, explaining the hadith. Previously, we ended off on this slide, which is B7.3 from the Reliance of the Traveler, the world's most popular Sharia manual. And it says, the proof of the legal authority of scholarly consensus is that as Allah ordered the believers in the Quran to obey both him and Muhammad, so too he ordered them to obey those of authority among them, saying, O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Prophet and those of authority among you. Those are their Imams and the scholars. And there's a hierarchy. And the lower ones obey the higher ones. And obey them such that when those of authority and legal expertise, the Mushtahids, agree upon a ruling, it is obligatory in the very words of the Quran to follow them and carry out their judgment. And Allah threatens those who oppose the Messenger and follow other than the believer's way, saying, Whoever controverts the messenger after guidance has become clear to him and follows other than the believer's way, we shall give him over to what he has turned to and roast him in hell. And how evil an outcome. Quran 4, 115. A second evidentiary aspect is that a ruling agreed upon by all the mushtahids in the Islamic community that Ummah is in fact the ruling of the community represented by its mushtahids. And there are many hadiths that have come from the Prophet as well as quotes from the companions, which indicate that the community is divinely protected from error, including his saying, my community shall not agree on an error. So the Islamic community believes that they are divinely protected from error. Allah is not wont to make my community concur on misguidance. That which the Muslims consider good, Allah considers good. Another hadith that scholars quote in connection with the validity of scholarly consensus is the following. The Prophet said, Allah's hand is over the group and whoever dissents from them departs to hell. Let's read the commentary which explains what this hadith is about. Meaning that whoever diverges from the overwhelming majority concerning what is lawful or unlawful and on which the community does not differ has slipped off the path of guidance and this will lead him to hell. Hadith wahi, in other words, they are revelation. Now, while it would be said that they are secondary revelation, second to the Quran, in fact, we will find that these are far more informative and I would say they are more leaning towards being primary revelation. Now, hadith refer to the sayings, actions, attributes, approvals of Muhammad. Some claim, and these are their arguments, not mine. I'm simply going to be providing some of the arguments that I've gathered that these scholars use. Some claim that one should reject all hadith because they're not as reliable as the Quran and adhere to the Quran alone. Those are Quranists. They are an outcast group. They would be apostates because they don't follow the instructions within the Quran. They're outside the community. However, many of the Quranists, the sudden appearance of Quran Yoon, who don't believe in anything other than the Quran, in the YouTube comments, I would say they are being deceptive. They're not being honest. I wouldn't believe them. However, in the Quran itself, Muslims are ordered to follow the Prophet in 100 verses, so approximately 100 verses. I do have a list. I'm not going to show it here for the, to save time. I may do so when I do the live show on Saturday with Thaddeus and Ayo. Therefore, it is not acceptable to say that we are ordered to follow the Prophet, but then have no way of knowing how to follow him, because Muhammad barely makes an appearance in the Quran. Where he does show up is in the Hadith and, of course, in the Sirah, the Sirah that... Muslims hide and do not want us to read. That would be what we call the prophetic biographies, but are more akin to the Gospels of Muhammad. It is not acceptable to say that it was an obligation upon the companions to follow the Prophet, but not those who came after. What is said in the Hadith and what is the example of Muhammad is binding. It is law for all time. The definition of Hadith. So though the word Hadith can refer to the sayings and actions of a companion, generally it is used in the context of what is attributed to Muhammad. These are his sayings, actions, attributes, approvals, and disapprovals, both implicit and explicit, things that he didn't do, things that he didn't explicitly say, but they either happened or they were not carried out. So thus, this is also taken into consideration. So hadith consists of two parts. We have the sanad with its plural isnad, the chain, the names of people, these are the narrators who told the Hadith. Then we have the Matan, the text of what was reportedly said or what reportedly happened. Now the fact that some Hadith narrations are unreliable does not mean that all narrations are unreliable. Scholars of Hadith were able to analyze the Sanad and the Matan of Hadith and determine if a narration is reliable. 
For example, if one of the narrators in the chain was known to be a liar, or if they were contradictory statements in the matan of a particular narration, the scholars of hadith would know that this particular narration is not reliable. This is how they describe how they go through this process. Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak said, the isnad is a part of our religion. Without the sanad, anyone could say whatever he wished. These chains of transmission are considered proof of Islam. The fact that there's a chain of communication, broken telephone from some guy in the beginning to some guy now, 1,400 years later, this is considered evidence. This is incontrovertible, irrefutable evidence, even if there is no written documentation. By implication, and I'm going to come to this a little later on, the Bible is not reliable in Islam. These are their criteria. Even though we have written documents that can be matched, something like 30,000 different copies of these documents, as well as secondary writings by other people with which we can actually reconstruct the Bible, they don't consider this evidence. In their terms, as long as there's a chain of narration, someone who told someone, 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 who told someone then what you have at the end is legit. This is how they grade the reliability of their scriptures. This is their proof. The references we utilize are not considered valid. Imam Muhammad ibn Sarin said, this knowledge is religion, so look thoroughly into the one from whom you take your religion. Yeah, we should look very closely into Muhammad. But notice that this knowledge of who told who told who told who, this is the religion. This is the basis of the reliability of Islam. This was narrated by Muslim in the introduction to his Asahi. So, Sahih Muslim, in other words, you'll know him as. Now, without a chain of narration for a claim, one cannot defend themselves when challenged. However, because we are not familiar with this, we don't consider this as valid, we don't know how to challenge them. Right? And of course, when they say that the Bible is unreliable, this is what they're referring to. These are their criteria. So a chain is proof of authenticity. So in summary, the Sanad preserves and protects Islam. They function as references, not the way we think of references. So having a chain means you're not following blindly, and having a chain means you're not leading astray. You can say, well, my forefather and his forefathers and his forefathers and that guy's neighbor and the other guy's neighbor and the other guy's neighbor, they all said the same thing, we're good. So understand that hadith is transmitted using broken telephone as the method. And this is what they consider the proof of Islam. So in addition to the reliability of the individual narrators, and so they look into the character of the narrator, Scholars also look at the number of routes of transmission for a particular narration. We'll describe that as we go, but basically 10 different people saw it. They each went their own way and they told other people and they told other people. And so a number of people ended up with this story and eventually the guy collecting it found that someone here, someone there, someone over there, they all tell the same story. It's all good. So Aditha classified based on route of transmission. We have Mutawatir, which means uninterrupted. This has multiple chains of transmission. Then we have Mashhur and Ahad, a relatively small number of transmitters. So in summary, the more chains of transmission, greater reliability of being true. And of course, other intermediary types also exist like Mustafid. So now Mutawatir means uninterrupted, multiple evidence hadiths. So multiple chains of narration hadiths. We have some main assumptions that they make. There are so many transmitters that there could be no collusion. That all the transmitters are known to be reliable and the transmitters are not under any compulsion to lie. This Saturday I'll be chatting with Thaddeus and Ayo, and I'd love Thaddeus to give this his uh, logical treatment. There are questions to be raised here. If you have a copy of the Encyclopedia of Islam, you can find this in Volume 9, page 371A. That's the left-hand column. And Volume 3, 25B, and Volume 7, 781B. I can link those, and you can also start examining this for yourself. Now, a Mutawatir hadith is narrated from the Prophet by a large group of companions who witnessed the event. They then conveyed it to a large group of people, who then conveyed it to another large group of people, who then conveyed it to another large group of their followers, and so on until today. So in their reasoning, this number of people would not make a mistake about what they narrated, nor collaborate to lie about it. And they would be unable to collaborate to lie about it. So let's look at Bukhari, Volume 5, Book 59, Hadith 473. This is the water miracle of the Prophet in Al-Hudabiyya, near Mecca. Narrated Salim, Jabir said, on the day of Al-Hudabiyya, 
The people felt thirsty in Allah's Messenger had a utensil containing water. He performed ablution from it, and then the people came towards him. Allah's Apostle said, What is wrong with you? The people said, O Allah's Messenger, we haven't got any water to perform ablution with or to drink, except what you have in your utensil. Now in some narrations it's a cup, and it was too small to hold his hands if his fingers were spread. He had to close his fingers together to get them in the cup. So the Prophet put his hand in the utensil, and the water started spouting out between his fingers like springs. So we drank and performed ablution. I said to Jabir, what was your number on that day? He replied, even if we had been 100,000, that water would have been sufficient for us. Anyhow, we were 1,500. I constantly hear, that's not in the Quran. That's not in the Quran. That violates the Quran. Yes, Islam violates the Quran. Islam uses these secondary sources as its primary sources. The Quran is the secondary source. These stories have been embellished over the years so that even though they come from a source that has less detail, in every retelling, detail is added. Patricia Croner, Jay Smith speaks about it a lot, discusses this. The grade of mutawatir means that this hadith is definitively confirmed. It cannot be false, it cannot be a lie, and it cannot be incorrect. According to the Islamic standards, those are indisputably true. There are further examples of this. You can see in Sahih Bukhari, Volume 1, Book 4, Hadith 199. Volume 7, Book 69, Hadith 543. Volume 4, Book 56, Hadith 772. And the additional four here, including Sahih Muslim, Book 30, Hadith 5656. Let's just read a random example I chose of this. Narrated Anas, a bowl of water was brought to the Prophet while he was at Azawra. He placed his hand in it and the water started flowing among his fingers. All the people performed ablution with that water. Katada asked Anas, how many people were you? Anas replied, 300, or nearly 300. So now we have multiple instances of this happening, or multiple retellings of the same event which have slight variations. Of course, in Christianity within the Gospels, if there are slight variations within the Gospels describing what happened with Jesus, these are considered false because, you know, variations. In the Hadith, which are considered indisputably true, even if they are large variations, it's like, it's all good. Like, what are you talking about? Now, let us look at something called Tawatur, which means well-attested. We have multiple kinds of Tawatur. We have Tawatur Lafzi. In the science of the tradition of Hadith, the verbatim or near verbatim with Tawatur transmission of a text. So here, fraud is unthinkable. This is distinguished from Tawatur Manawi, transmission according to the just or one salient feature of a given text. In other words, with the previous hadith, if they all said, look, he stuck his fingers in a bowl of water, everyone was thirsty, no one had water to wash, and water came out, and whether there was this many people or that many people, the gist of it is, he made water appear from his hands, and he had a bowl that kept on giving water, just didn't run out of water. So that means that this is true, because that salient feature remains. Otherwise, if the wording is nearly verbatim, all verbatim, then you have Tawatir Lafzi. Now we find that this kind of transmission heavily outweighs the Tawatir Lafzi, and you can find more in the Encyclopedia of Islam, volume 10 through 81b, that's the right-hand column. So narrators do not necessarily have to be trustworthy and upright, but what they call adl, nor Muslims. Even a liar may occasionally speak the truth, they tell us, and conversely, a trustworthy person may lie, or have been told a lie and repeat it, or he may be mistaken. The example they give us is, can we confirm that Japan exists, even if we've never been? To Japan. 